Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Bowman, Editor-in-Chief of Supply Chain Brain, and I want to welcome you to the first episode in the Deloitte Supply Chain Brain webinar series 2023-2024. Our theme today is Navigating to Net Zero, Procurement's Role in Supplier Emissions, and our presentation is on Reducing Greenhouse Gas Scope 3 Emissions. One quick reminder, there will be an audience question and answer session at the end of this presentation. Audience members are encouraged to submit their questions at any time during the presentation by clicking on that Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Now, scope one and two emissions, they are currently the elephant in the room of many boardrooms. The mouse in the corner, however, is scope three emissions, or those that are an indirect result of a company's value chain. And that mouse is growing larger. As a result, companies with net zero carbon strategies are seeing the urgent need to address scope three emissions, which often account for the largest portion of their carbon footprint. So today, we're going to learn about Deloitte's five-stage framework based on wide-ranging data about the role of procurement in reaching sustainability goals. So let's take a look at the key topics that we'll be addressing today. We'll start out by asking, why are scope three emissions important to your organization? We'll learn how to reduce your organization's supplier-driven scope three emissions, and we'll talk about where to start tackling scope three emissions. With that, I want to introduce our speakers for today. Spencer Young is a principal with Deloitte Consulting. He leads sustainable procurement within Deloitte's supply chain and network operations practice, primarily focusing on helping retail and consumer products clients transform their end-to-end -end supply chains in the service of escalating customer expectations, advancing digital technologies, and the increasing emphasis on sustainability. Stephanie Noyes is a manager in the Deloitte supply chain and network operations practice. With more than 15 years of experience, Stephanie merges her information technology knowledge from the Army with her graduate school focus on sustainability to help clients improve their value chains. Stephanie primarily supports transformation in clients in the consumer industry. And with that, I want to turn it over to Stephanie Noyes. Stephanie, take it away. Right. Thank you for the introduction, Bob. We appreciate that. Um, so reducing scope three emissions is just one component of a company's broader sustainability journey to reduce emissions, but it's important enough that we recently published a paper on it, and Spencer and I are excited to share some insights from that paper here with the supply chain brain audience. So we want to start with kind of the broader picture of why there or what value sustainability drives for companies. So there are a number of reasons why an individual person may choose to take uh, more sustainable actions, but corporations are also making more environmentally focused decisions, uh, not only because of the consumer or the government and consumer pressure, but also because many of these levers differentiate their products. They drive operational efficiency, lower the cost of capital, um, and help retain their workforce. So as you can see, there are numerous reasons for a company to and become more sustainable. Now, as we switch to the next slide, we'll also see through recent uh, leadership surveys that Deloitte conducts um, that senior leaders are also progressing in their understanding of the importance of sustainability. So in our recent uh, CXO survey, which covers a variety of leaders um, at that C-suite, um, they have said that almost all the respondents for that survey indicated that their companies were negatively impacted by climate change in some way over the last year. Moving down into um, one of our other surveys specifically to, for chief procurement officers, um, they found that enhancing ESG has become the second priority um, for chief procurement officers in 2023. And this is moving up from the sixth place in 2021. So you can see that it's definitely rising in importance. And then the third one there, chief procurement officers, 67% um, of them have indicated that they have ESG or net zero commitments. So they've made commitments. And now we want to talk about you know, how to actually mobilize and um, you know, make progress against those goals. So before we go into our five step framework that Bob mentioned, we want to make sure the audience is starting from the same baseline of knowledge. So um, on this slide, you'll see what are those three scopes. As we talk about scope three, that means that there's another scope one and a scope two in there also. 
So um, to level set everyone, scope one is those direct emissions from sources owned or controlled by your company. So examples of that can be your on-site fossil fuel combustion. Um, if your company has a fleet of vehicles, that fleet fuel consumption all fall under that scope one. Scope two, those indirect emissions from the generation of purchased electricity. So as you're buying all your different utilities from utility companies, that all falls into that scope three emissions bucket. And then scope three, or scope two emissions bucket. Scope three is our focus for today. And those are all those other indirect emissions from entities that aren't controlled or owned by your company. So it can be the upstream purchase materials or downstream use of your actual products that are sold. Um, and when you're tackling your greenhouse gas emissions, organizations should be considering all three of these scopes. But this is a supply chain brain seminar, so or webinar. So, um, how does this affect supply chain and specifically my procurement team? So, within those scope three emissions, one that I mentioned was the purchased goods and services. So, that category generally accounts for most of your scope three emissions. Um, and so, what your company is purchasing, who they're buying from, is probably one of the biggest parts of your emissions. And that's something that you're going to need to address as you aim for those reduction goals and those net zero goals that many companies are putting out. So now that we've given you a little background, um, we want to talk about um, you know, how to identify and address those greenhouse gas emissions. So this slide gets, starts to get into that five-step approach. And we realize there's a lot on here. So um, Spencer and I are going to go through each of these five steps and talk about some of the, the key components um, of this five-step approach. So, you know, companies are gonna need to prioritize where they focus their resources and how they address these emissions in a strategic way. So we will, let's go into step one and Spencer, I will turn it over to you to talk about assessing their baseline. Excellent, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, and I will add that this is uh, not a carbon accounting masterclass. Um, so even on uh, a few slides back uh, where Stephanie was talking about the 15 uh, different categories of scope three, um, it's okay if you don't know what your profile for your business looks like. Um, there's actually pretty good benchmarks out there at a industry and sector level that helps break it down for you. Um, you know, some of these categories, as an example, is uh, the emissions associated with your franchise. You know, if you're not in a quick serve uh, restaurant capacity, or you're not in an industry that uses franchises, then you're not going to have any scope three emissions associated with franchises. Um, part of the reason that we chose, um, you know, uh, category one purchase goods and services is because it is typically fairly large across all uh, industries and sectors. And it's something that fits uh, wholly within the remit of uh, procurement. So on our five step um, approach that we see uh, companies progressing against. Uh, the first step on this journey is assessing the baseline or uh, measuring what is my carbon footprint today. Um, this is um, an entire. This could be an entire day long seminar in and of itself. Um, so we want to give kind of the taste to help everyone uh, be smart enough to be dangerous. Um, but there's uh, entire books that have been written um, about this topic. Actually, sir. I was just looking at the over 100 page um, document from the Greenhouse yep. Gas Protocol yesterday and measuring scope three. So it really is a book. Yes. Um, so it's a book and it changes relatively frequently um, as our measurement methodologies get better um, from the NGO community. The important uh, piece to understand here is just like in procurement, your baseline understanding of your uh, categories is your spend, your spend baseline. Uh, very similar with carbon. The first step here is to get an emissions baseline. And there's a few different ways to go about the measurement question. And the important piece is that there's lots of options and there's no perfect solution here. So uh, you basically have a spectrum of choices um, from the things that are not very accurate, but easy to do, all the way to the things that are difficult, but very precise. So most companies, when they start on this journey, uh, they start with a, a spend-based baseline. And what this simply does is it takes what spend your organization uh, is buying today across different categories of spend, and it's applying 
uh, industry emissions factors to it. So it can say that for every thousand dollars worth of uh, airfare you've purchased, it's this many uh, you know pounds of carbon. Uh, and so the idea is, is that you're able to translate from spend to uh, CO2e, which is uh, CO2 equivalent. Um, so you have a common denominator for your emissions profile. Uh, that works on first blush, um, but there are plenty of places where that measurement methodology breaks down. The very easy <clears throat> answer is if you are sourcing mugs, for, sorry, mugs, for example, and you save 5%, then the spend-based estimation methodology would tell you that you just cut your carbon uh, emissions associated with uh, you know, your consumables by 5%, when really you didn't. You're not buying any less. You're just simply spending a little less. And conversely, when there's inflationary pressures on your categories, you may end up spending 10 20% more on a category. Um, and it may appear then that you are actually associated with higher emissions when that's really not the case. So there's common recognition that spend-based is the quick and dirty answer, it's not great. As you move down the list into average data, then you're starting to get a little bit more granular with how you calculate it. And so rather than just taking kind of a spend and spend factor approach, you're now starting to look at, well, how many specific units of this did I buy? And how do I decompose these units into how much how much of different plastics is, am I buying? How much of different metals am I buying? And you're, you've got a more precise denominator that you then can apply more precise factors to and you can get a more precise measurement. Again, this, this takes more data and more effort to get to that. We have a hybrid, which is really a mix of all of them. Um, and then the, the very best from a precision standpoint is supplier specific. And so this is where companies, um, especially those that are purchasing a few common items um, you know, across their business, uh, they will actually go to the suppliers and issue a survey to understand what is the carbon footprint associated with this product or this good that I'm purchasing. And so that can be very precise, uh, but that can also be very difficult because it's onerous on the supply base and it's very manual um, and, and detailed uh, for the company. And so the ultimate right answer here, I always tell our clients that you can't measure your way to success here. And so the right answer is not to stay only in spend-based. The right answer is not to survey every single supplier on every single thing that you purchase. Um, ultimately, the right answer is somewhere in that hybrid bucket where it's being diligent around um, how do I have a good enough emissions footprint so that I can prioritize the right actions to take in service of reducing um, my emissions. So again, it's not... You know, I've, there's many, many clients that have struggled with the data availability or how, you know, do I survey every supplier that I have? And I think that sometimes they lose track of that North Star of this is all about incenting action to actually partner with your value chains to reduce emissions. So let's suppose that you've worked through and you've got a good enough footprint of your emissions. Then if we can go to the next slide. Now we get to the actual exciting part, which is to figure out what we're going to do about it instead of just measuring it. Uh, and so there's a couple of lenses that we've seen in the industry and across industries uh, that are important to keep in mind. So as you think about how do I want to segment my supply base, there's a couple of different lenses here. Um, one is that you could focus across your entire supply base. So I have policies and procedures that all of my suppliers, if you want to do business with our organization, must meet. Um, so for example, there's uh, the Salesforce, you know, Salesforce has an exhibit, uh, the sustainability exhibit in, in all of their contracts uh, that stipulates that you need to have a path to net zero and you need to be offsetting any emissions you currently have. Uh, otherwise, um, you know, there's ramifications. Um, so that's something that's supply base wide. Now, that's not the only lens you can take. You can also look at this category by category. Uh, so imagine that you are um, a car manufacturer. You're going to need to look at your battery value chain a little bit different from uh, your metals and a little different from your consumables and lubricants and everything else that you use in the manufacture of a car. And so you might say, hey, there's specific categories that I want to segment and treat differently. And then finally, uh, you see that there's a number of places where uh, you know, companies will partner with their largest suppliers to actually try to catalyze an innovation in a specific value chain. Um, so a great example of this uh, would be about a month or two ago, 
uh, Walmart had announced um, a co-investment fund with PepsiCo around generative agriculture. And so this is a great example of getting very targeted on some of your largest suppliers to partner with. So the first lens I want everyone to take here is this level of focus, whether you're looking at all of your suppliers in aggregate, whether you're looking at specific categories or you're looking at specific large suppliers. The other lens that's useful, um, can go to the next slide, around formulating a strategy is what we've affectionately called the carrot to stick matrix. And so as we thought about what are different strategies that companies are taking, uh, we saw that there was a natural clustering across two, two uh, axes. Um, one, which is the x-axis here, which is our, our carrot to stick. Um, so are you enforcing requirements on your suppliers and you've got uh, punitive contractual language um, in order to help them do the right thing from a sustainability standpoint? Or are you incenting them and creating opportunity for them to grow their business um, by, uh, by uh, getting on board with these sustainability efforts? The y-axis... Uh, looks at how involved are you as the as the company and as procurement in these value chains. So we've seen examples where there's a very collaborative approach, um, where you've got companies that are actively partnering uh, with their suppliers to change the value chains. There's other examples where the companies are delegating uh, that authority and that decisioning down to their suppliers, and they just want to know that it's getting done. And so there's a, a mix here that we've seen across the industries and across companies around, do they take a carrot or a stick and are they getting involved in these changes or are they merely um, you know, delegating it to their supply bases? And so these two frames um, are a useful way to facilitate that dialogue within a procurement organization of thematically, how do we want to interact with our suppliers? And then are there places that are culturally aligned or misaligned with how we relate to our suppliers and how our company uh, relates to society writ large. So, oh, sorry, go ahead, Stephanie. Well, I was going to say, yeah, and in our, um, those surveys that I mentioned earlier in our CXO sustainability survey, we saw that uh, like almost half of the CXOs are requiring suppliers to meet certain sustainability criteria and going with a bit more of the stick method at first. Um, but you know, as we've discussed before, Spencer, like that alone is definitely not sufficient to drive progress. And you're going to need some of that collaboration too. So hopefully we'll see some progress along the spectrum. Yep. Yeah, no, you're spot on. I mean, I would say that <clears throat> the collaboration is necessary because there's not always an obvious answer out there that you can just contractually require. Um, and so there are, you know, that that's the exciting part and the challenging part around ESG is that oftentimes the technology that solves this doesn't exist. And so it's the imperative is on procurement to serve as the catalyst to work with the supply base to actually figure out what's the right answer. What is that new sustainable option that helps meet everyone's uh, goals? So uh, spot on, it's like just, you know, there's no one right answer on these matrices and it's not that you have to pick one exact spot. So you can look at a company and they, like a Salesforce, you can have kind of the, the bottom left-hand corner where you've got the contractual enforcement, but then you can also have programs in place in the top right-hand corner where you're collaborating with some of your supplier partners as well. So it's not an either or. I want everyone to take away that it's, it's being thoughtful about what's the portfolio of strategies you wanna take against your different categories of spend. Makes sense. So then if we go to the next page, now we're starting to think about, all right, how does that translate into actual initiatives that I need to mobilize my category managers and others against? And so this is where the Environmental Defense Fund or EDF has done um, some really good thinking here around different rubrics that anyone can take and use to evaluate different ideas. And so uh, you, know, you can evaluate these ideas, you score them, and then you prioritize them with a classic uh, prioritization matrix. And the important takeaway here is that there's a number of different lenses um, that, that one needs to take when you're evaluating these initiatives. Uh, I think that there's a common misnomer that I've heard from a number of CPOs where there's a, an assumption that sustainability is going to cost more. And there's certainly examples where that's certainly true, um, especially for more nascent technologies. Um, but the, the attitude and the, the approach that we should all take is more of a doing good by doing well approach. 
and recognizing that there are opportunities um, to use sustainability as uh, the impetus to actually come up with a new, better way of doing something that also happens to be uh, lower cost. And so you see that lens reflecting in the evaluation frame so that there's a series of questions around, all right, what's the impact on climate? All right, that's pretty obvious. Um, what is the business value? And this is business value on either a cost reduction basis um, or business value, more importantly, um, around how does this resonate with uh, my downstream customers and my brand positioning? There is the question around what's the investment? Um, what's the what's the cost and feasibility of this investment? Um, oftentimes, this can be something as simple as, as simply swapping something you're purchasing today. The classic example is copier paper, where nobody really notices if there's post-consumer recycled content in there. Um, but it can have a much more substantive uh, impact as well, uh, where you're actually starting to touch on the manufacturing process. You're touching on product design. You're touching on elements that get very, um, very much to the heart of the business. And then finally, the fourth uh, lens here is around equity and justice and thinking about, you know, to whom do these benefits accrue? Um, you know, we all live in the same um, atmosphere, uh, but oftentimes when we have um, organizations looking at sustainability from a procurement standpoint, it's just opening the question of, you know, who's benefiting from some of these investments and who's benefiting from some of this uh, mitigation. Yeah, on so, that note, so yeah. I know we had a project where the client was looking at things and, you know, we had the sustainability people and then we had the um, supplier diversity people and kind of the trade-offs there. And some of the things we looked at were, you know, are there certain categories, going back to some of that, like how you divide things up, were there certain categories in this case that they decided, okay, this is more of a priority for our diversity um, aspect and they could um, take certain services, for example, like legal services and say, that's gonna be a focus here. And therefore we can focus on our spend that we wanna get down for sustainability and our emissions on some of these other categories that have an even bigger impact there. I think that goes into that evaluation piece also. Yep. Yeah, you're spot on. And I would say that as you're developing this roadmap, this roadmap is not distinct and separate from your existing sourcing roadmap that you have in place today. And so I think Stephanie, you're, you're spot on, um, you know, in, in the same way that you shouldn't be undertaking this just for emissions purposes. Um, this is something that needs to integrate into how you do business um, and how you interact with your supply markets. Absolutely. All right, so now let's, um, let's keep going. Uh, so now we're in the exciting part. So we have uh, grappled with all of our measurement. We have thought about how we segment our supply base uh, and aligned on kind of the tones and tactics we want to take. Uh, we've come up with our portfolio of initiatives. We've got, you know, ye old roadmap for the next three to 10 years. And now we're ready to start executing, which is exciting because all the way up. So we've been talking to you for 24 minutes and we have not reduced any emissions. Uh, so this is where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. Uh, we're actually starting to execute. So uh, companies that are now looking at execution, um, you know, it's not, hey, we got these 10 initiatives, let's go and you're ready. Um, there's a fair amount of preparation that needs to happen. Um, one of the big pain points that CPOs uh, have been having, you see it a little bit in the CPO survey, um, and certainly we, we've heard it from some of our clients, is just internal capabilities. Um, you know, this this oftentimes can feel like, you know, one more thing on a category manager's plate. Um, and ultimately, procurement organizations have people who are very focused on knowing their value chains, on knowing what drives costs in their categories, and they know their business and their business partners. They are not necessarily sustainability people. They don't necessarily have all the right skills that they need um, in order to understand emissions, in order to understand um, other ESG considerations in their value chains. And so there is an internal capability assessment that needs to happen here before you start executing to make sure that everyone's on a level playing field. Now, the good news is, is that sustainability is exceptionally important to younger generations. And so this is an opportunity to help position procurement as a talent magnet um, and as a way to train up the next generation of uh, sustainability uh, professionals. Um, you know, communications, 
kickoff supply engagement is arguably more critical than usual um, because what you are really trying to do here is partner with your supply chains and partner with your supplier partners uh, in order to make change. Uh, it is much better to align these communications and the style with the segmentation and the frame that we talked about earlier um, and help make sure that people or the, make sure that your suppliers view this as an opportunity to collaborate with your organization, not that this is you know, the 10th page of requirements that you're saddling with them. And then just recognizing that this is something that's going to require continuous uh, care and feeding around. <clears throat> um, so having the education to suppliers um, providing support to your suppliers on what you're asking them to do is absolutely critical here. Um, you know, and then ultimately making sure that, uh, you know, what you are stipulating actually has some teeth and that you have the right policies in place and even integrated this into your contracts with your suppliers so that you know that it's not just a, a warm and fuzzy conversation that you've had with your suppliers, but it's actually something that has a little teeth. Um, so Stephanie, I know you've spent some time researching on kind of a good a good sampler of uh, companies that show the diversity of, of how they're executing against these. Uh, do you want to share a little bit? Yeah, so we've got three organizations that we chose out of our, our many examples um, that we've highlighted here. So first off, Walmart. You know, Spencer mentioned uh, Walmart earlier, but they um, have an interesting model where they're providing suppliers to access to financing to support their pursuit of sustainability goals. So um, sometimes these things do cost money. They are expensive, depending on what some of those um, projects that your organization is taking on. And so they've got an interesting model of collaborating with a supplier to help pay for those because it's going to benefit them in their emissions journey also. Um, and then they also have the, you know, co certain contract terms that are preferential if you're doing, if you're taking action to reduce emissions. Um, looking at Salesforce, another one that we've mentioned they added that sustainability exhibit in their sourcing process. So they require the suppliers that are represent 60% of their scope three greenhouse gas emissions um, to set science-based targets. And that's a specific type of target that goes through a process to make sure that it's in line with um, your science-based process. And there's a whole SBTI group that will approve those. Um, and they... Um, so they also have this as part of their the contractual obligations um, going into like setting those targets and reducing those emissions. And then the third one we have on here is Apple. So they are also co-investing and one of their focus areas was renewable energy. So um, specifically in China, they created this China Clean Energy Fund. That's where many of their factories are. So they are co-investing with suppliers to um, give more opportunity for those manufacturers to use clean energy. You know, it's hard to reduce your emissions if you don't have access to some of the you know, clean energy, renewable energy. So they've got one thing there where they're investing there. They're, offer, they're also sharing data with their suppliers, offering training materials on how to navigate the challenges um, in reducing emissions. And they've actually scaled that um, supplier clean energy program to over 200 suppliers and continuing to grow year over year. So just a, a couple examples of how they, um, you know, we're using those models that we talked about before. A lot of these are kind of incentive collaborate type engagement models that we mentioned on that, that carrot and stick. Um, but they also start with a lot of, um, you know, contract and enforcement engagement things too. They, once again, it's that combination of things. It's not just all one engagement strategy. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So now we've, Move through execution, and now we're into the very last stage of monitor and manage. And the idea here is that this is an ongoing process. This is not a one-time thing. And so, you know, the chief procurement officer is going to be expected to be able to report back progress against these goals or the contribution to these goals. Um, and so this is both a topic that uh, is appropriate within procurement, but also how it ladders up into an ESG office. Um, or ultimately into the C-suite around how um, your organization is making progress against these goals. Uh, the bedrock of this is around setting the metrics up front that are uh, practical to collect um, and something that indicates kind of leading, um, you know, uh, metrics that are leading indicators of progress being made, but then also reincorporating that into your emissions um, measurement approach to make sure that you're able to show 
all right, my suppliers are doing the right things. We're operationally seeing this happen, and we're seeing this reflect itself in uh, in actual emissions measurement and emissions um, estimations uh, that we're creating. And so working within your organization around the data and the procedures to make sure that there's a measurement methodology uh, that passes the passes muster um, and that ultimately ladders up ladders up to additional uh, reporting that your organization is likely doing. And then making sure that this is all wrapped around the change management, um, around making sure that there's clear, role, clear roles and responsibilities around who's collecting the data, who's transforming and manipulating that data to get to the emissions measurement, um, coming up with you know, the SOPs and the training for, um, for your people, and ultimately coming up with what do you play back to your supply base to show uh, progress against these goals. Um, so, you know, a number of companies that we saw have dedicated supplier sustainability summits where they get their largest suppliers uh, together to talk about their goals, to talk about the progress they're making against those goals, um, and to celebrate the wins and workshop the challenges uh, that they're seeing as they make progress against this. So very much, you know, we should all think about this as a closed loop where we measure it, we prioritize, take action, and then we track it on the back end, and then ultimately it all feeds back together. <laughs> so again, if there's one slide that I've had clients that, you know, print it out and put it on the wall, um, it's this. This is uh, the snapshot of everything that we've just talked through from assessing your baseline, setting your goals and strategy, coming up with those individual initiatives, executing against them, um, and then monitoring and managing uh, against that. So, you know, as as procurement leaders, um, as supply chain leaders, when you think about, hey, I know that our sustainability report just came out. Um, I see that we've got a, a net zero commitment on 2030, 2040, 2050, depending on your industry. Um, a number of companies have scope three included in those uh, path to net zero commitments. You should start thinking, hey, what is the supply chain contribution to scope three? How would I go about that? How should I think about this? Um, that way it's not something that's just being delegated into the bowels of a sustainability office for somebody to measure it for two years and no progress is made. Um, you know, what we've seen and what we've been working with our clients on is something that's much more comprehensive and much more complete because ultimately, you know, nobody here on this webinar joined because we just want to talk about measuring emissions and measure how fast the world is heating up. And if you did, I apologize. <laughs> um, you know, ultimately we are all here. Um, because we care about meaningfully improving kind of the planet and meaningly, meaningfully improving um, our progress against our, our client or our climate change commitments we've made. So this is one thing, you know, this is one page that we've found really helps frame that conversation. So then if we can go to the, uh, the next slide, uh, the other question that you're likely asking is like, so what do I do next? Like, where do I start? Um, and so what we've uh, thought through are a couple of probing questions, just recognizing that every company is starting from a slightly different spot. So I would first ask myself, you know, do I have the right data to measure my scope three emissions? Um, and if you do, awesome. Your next, your next stop is to start measuring. So you've got a baseline that your business is comfortable with. Um, if you're not sure, that's also totally okay, then I'd be raising my hand and fostering that conversation within my business uh, to get at the prioritization that it needs. Uh, a number of companies, they've solved the measurement question. So then they start to grapple with the second piece, which is around, do I have the alignment um, to tackle scope three emissions? Um, recognizing that this is something that is oftentimes broader than just traditional procurement. This can start to get into product design. This can start to get into operations. Um, you know, there's a need to make sure that you've got the right leadership support around uh, tackling scope three emissions. And that's true for scope three emissions. It's also true for really what we're just talking about here around purchase goods and services. So maybe you've got your measurement, you've got your alignment. So now the question is, do I have the right capabilities within my procurement organization uh, to tackle this? And so this is where we've seen companies internally look and say, do I have the right, you know, do my do my, uh, does my organization have the right like category knowledge? Do I understand my value chains well enough? Do I have the right ESG skills? Do I have the right storytelling skills and the right analytical skills I need in order to create this full-fledged business case? 
Um, oftentimes, you know, I, I've talked with companies where, um, you know, they recognize that, hey, I, I have a very limited headcount in procurement. And so what I really need to do is focus on automation and digital transformation that's frankly not focused on ESG in order to free up people's time so that they can focus on this. Because um, this is a very strategic, but also frankly time intensive um, area to focus in for procurement. And then finally, if you check yes to all three of them, then awesome, you get a gold star. Now the question is, all right, is my organization truly ready to start driving these reductions? You know, Am I ready to start progressing through those five steps. And if you're already halfway through some of the steps, awesome. Um, but what we've tried to, you know, what we, we've discussed internally is that, you know, every organization's in a slightly different starting spot. Some have not measured anything at all. Some have measured things, but procurement is still trying to figure out if they are really going to make a run at this. Um, and some organizations, like some of those that we've pointed at uh, as examples, are further along in their journeys. And I think that the important takeaway is that it's okay, regardless of where you are. Um, what's important is to understand, does my organization have an ESG target um, and goals in place and start the conversation around how procurement can support it. And so with that, um, I think we are ready for a Q and A. Well, thank you very much, Spencer. And thank you, Stephanie, for that uh, really detailed methodology to how to get your arms around scope three emissions, especially timely, because we are starting to hear a lot about companies that are falling down on their targets for net zero emissions. And the reason they are doing it is largely because their scope three emissions are out of control. So this is a great opportunity for companies to and individuals and executives to learn how to how to get your arms around that. Thanks a lot. That puts us into the uh, panel portion of our discussion here, in which I'll be asking you a few questions to elaborate on what you've already said. Well, let me start with you, Spencer. You know, we talked about earlier about there being 15 categories defined under scope three per the greenhouse gas protocol. Uh, tell me more about why we should consider focusing on category one, purchase goods and services. Yeah, a couple of reasons, Bob. Um, one is that... Uh, across industries, it's typically either the first or second largest of the 15 categories within scope three. So if you're just looking at it as how do I re how do I get the biggest bang for my buck, um, you know, uh, targeting the largest categories of emissions in the same way that you target the largest categories of spend um, is a pretty safe bet. Um, the other the other reason is that you know specifically for procurement, um, it is the the top category in which you have the most influence. As you look at the other categories within uh, scope three, uh, some have nothing to do, frankly, with procurement or with supply chain. Um, this is the one where uh, procurement has the clearest delineation of responsibility, as well as uh, the greatest uh, sphere of influence. Yeah, I mean, we nominally talk about scope three as being emissions outside the company's control, but not exactly true if you can address it from a procurement standpoint, very much within your control to do something about it. So thank you for that. So, Stephanie, and by the way, before I ask another question, I do want to remind you, this is the panel portion of our discussion, but we are going to still have that audience Q&A at the end. Audience members, you can continue to submit your questions at any time, uh, and we'll get to as many of those when we get to the Q&A as possible. So, Stephanie, uh, what are some of the complexities that are preventing companies from moving faster on reducing scope three emissions? Yeah, so, Bob, I would say there's probably three main complexities that come up. Um, one of them is accurate data and access to that accurate data. So I know Spencer talked a bit about, you know, there's different ways to measure. And sometimes you just have to go with that, that kind of easier ones where you can get the data at first that's spin based and then improve it as you go along. So that's one of the, the areas. Um, and, you know, as your supply base also improves in their measurement, since that's where you're gathering the data from as you go along that. Um, the next one is that engagement with suppliers. So when you're engaging your supplier base, there are a lot of different functions involved. Um, procurement may be one of the, you know, is probably one of the primary interactors with suppliers, but the business leaders, the actual buyers and users of the, um, you know, purchase goods and services are also interacting with suppliers. So sometimes balancing those roles and responsibilities and those incentives, making sure that the whole company knows about them um, and being able to balance them. Um, that's like another one of those complexities and kind of where procurement can pay, can play a, a key role in like navigating those supplier relationships. 
Then I would say the third one is probably around um, supply chain transparency. This is another thing we talk about in that paper we mentioned where um, carbon footprint monitoring across the value chain, it requires you to have visibility, not just to your tier one suppliers, but also like tier two and further down. And we even do like whole projects and like supplier illumination where you can like kind of see down your value chain and understand like where the emissions may be coming from because you know, there's suppliers making things for your suppliers and on down, you know, down to the raw materials and such. Yeah. So I'd say those, those three. Thank you. Spencer, how long does implementation of this framework typically take? I mean, we don't have a lot of time to be making some change in our, in our models. How long does it take to see the benefits? Yeah, no, a uh, great question. It's, uh, it's a frustrating answer, which is it depends. Um, so to put it in context, so like a number of companies have 2030, 2040, and 2050 goals in place. And so one of the challenges of this approach is that it needs to provide satisfying progress in the short run while still making progress against the thing that could be decades away when realistically none of us are still in these chairs. And so what I would say and what I, what I tell the clients is that you know, starting the measurement journey, starting to prioritize, starting to come up with what's the portfolio of initiatives that I want to take, that's something that you can do in a quarter or two. Now, over time, it takes longer to actually get to the, you know, get more accurate measurements, but you can get to a series of no regrets things you need to do within your, within your value chains in relatively quick order. Now, when do I start to see the benefits? So there's a number of levers that within procurement you could pull and you could see benefit in months, not years. Um, so this is changing your specifications to things that are already available and more sustainable. This is transitioning spend from less sustainable suppliers to more sustainable suppliers. So there's things you can do in the immediate run. Now, I think that the meaningful change and actually reaching into our respective value chains and actually changing how products and services are manufactured and delivered that takes time, right? So that can be something where, hey, in a couple of years, we're starting to get more green cement, or this could be something where, hey, we need to collaborate with some of our, our upstream suppliers and OEMs in order to figure out what's a more sustainable alternative, and that could take five to 10 years. So there's a whole host, and so the, one of the big takeaways here should be that everyone views this as a portfolio. I assure you in the same way that I would be kicked out of a CPO's office if I came in and said that there's things that they can do and only 20 years plus out, um, that's not an okay answer. Um, but realistically, we're not going to, you're not going to hit your emissions target in six months either. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, let's at this point bring the audience in. We do have some questions already coming in, and I will once again repeat that you can continue to submit those questions even as we are answering what's here already, and we'll get to them as many of many of them as possible, uh, time permitting. So the question here is ESG, that is environmental, social, and governance, and sustainability. That, of course, is a prominent topic today. The questioner says, can you explain how government programs and initiatives are helping to support this transition. Stephanie, you want to take that? Sure. So we talked about how, you know, Walmart is giving financial incentives. Well, the great thing is the government is too. And so um, I want to start by saying I am not a tax professional. So you should definitely lean on your tax professionals or delight. We have like a breadth of knowledge there, including some people who are experts in this. But there are three main um bills right now that are supporting investment. There's the Inflation Reduction Act the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, and then the Chips and Science Act. And I would say nearly all businesses can pursue investment opportunities covered by those bills. Um, it can be anything from renewable energy investment, domestic manufacturing, the commercial fleet electrification. A lot of companies have their own fleet. So those are just a few ways how those um, government programs and incentives can kind of support different companies' journeys um, as they try to reduce their scope three emissions. Thank you. Spencer, the questioner wants to know how to define a good baseline if our organization is just starting to measure our scope three impact. Yep. Yeah. So ultimately, I tell everyone you're, we're not going to measure our way out of success. So, or measure our way to success. Um, mm -hmm. So ultimately, the the ultimate evaluation of do I have a baseline that's good enough is is it stable 
against methodology changes? And does it lead you to the right set of things to do with your supply base? Um, so if, you know, if you know that your emissions baseline is really shaky and held up with bubble gum and duct tape because it's just spend based, um, then you may say, hey, we need to refine this a little bit more. Um, but oftentimes organizations take a look at it and say like, you know what, we are comfortable with, uh, with uh, the level of rigor that we've put into it. Uh, you know, we've engaged a number of NGOs like CDP um, and others in order to help validate it. And so we are confident that this is complete enough that it's something to reasonably take action on. Um, I'll join this into actually two of the questions that are on the that are related to this um, in the Q and A because Peter had asked like where is the data located? Um, so typically your data, um, your spend data is obviously within your procurement organization and within your procurement systems. Uh, most companies have a, a spend cube that they can use to understand. Uh, you know, what am I buying with whom, who's purchasing it and so on. So that's the that's the bedrock of this spend-based estimation. As you start to move and get a little bit more sophisticated, and this is where you move outside of scope three, category one, um, there are a number of systems uh, out there that companies are starting to use like Invisi and there's uh, dozens others uh, that are focused on just housing um, emissions data and sustainability data um, because then it provides an audit trail, uh, but it also provides a place where it can all live holistically. Because um, what you don't want, like imagine that you're the your company's CEO, you probably don't want procurement measuring and capturing emissions data for scope three, category one over here. You've got a different organization that's catching other emissions data over here, and it all lives in a million different places because then it's very difficult to put together a consolidated report. Yeah, good point. What are some common pitfalls that organizations should be aware of when implementing ESG initiatives, especially for scope three? Spencer, again, maybe this is another one for you. Yeah, biggest pitfall that I've seen um, is just operating in a silo. Um, so these are, and it's silo within your organization, but it's also a silo with your um, with your suppliers. And what I mean by that is that, um, you know, for most of these changes, that you would be making, um, you know, to Stephanie's point, there's a ripple effect and there's a ramification outside of just procurement. And so making sure that you've got the right cross-functional stakeholders um, across the business is important. Um, and then also making sure that you're involving your suppliers and your other constituents in that decisioning. Um, it's much easy, easier <clears throat> to co-create with them. Um, you know, I, we always like to say that like the best idea is whatever your idea was. And so helping involve them in that process um, is a really important way to, um, to build that buy-in. Um, I'd also join in, kind of Catherine had a question around uh, lessons learned around the business case to tackle scope three emissions. Um, so, you know, business case means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, and so I think that there's an important piece to be able to translate, hey, here's the big marquee initiatives that we want to tackle. And here's, even if it's just t-shirt sizing, here's the expected impact from like a cost standpoint in the short term and the long term from a supply availability standpoint. Is this a long-term strategic partner that can help bend the cost curve longer run? And so having a more comprehensive business case is usually more valuable than just having a single number. Um, where I've found... Um, you know, not everyone is, is, is immersed in sustainability. And so having a couple of those stories is really, really critical, um, as opposed to other business cases, which might lend itself to a more straightforward, straightforward IRR hurdle um, or other kind of traditional business case approach. So it all comes down to being to successfully selling the case through all of this to the C-suite, especially the CEO at, you know, the uh, role of procurement used to be uh, very simple. Get me the cheapest price. And yep. even today, executives are under pressure to make those <coughs> quarterly results for their stockholders. And along comes this very complex methodology that they have to pay attention to, too. Everything you just said to me, Spencer, and everything you said to our audience, do you think will serve to convince them of the need to embrace this? Uh, I think so, because I think that the predicated on all this is that we're not tackling scope three just for its own sake for fun um yeah. it's because this is this is all laddering up to a 
corporate wide commitment that the organization has made to the board and to external stakeholders around the path to net zero. So the mm -hmm. framing that the framing should not be, hey, we've got all these cost pressures, let's go do something else that's complex and kind of messy. I think that the the messaging is, hey, we need we need to find a way to bend long-term cost curves while also making progress against commitments that we've made to the street and our investors and stakeholders. Right. Indeed, given all the talk and pressure about ESG, the pressure may not it may not be a case of applying pressure to the board. It may be coming from the board oh, <laughs> trying to get procurement to make these changes. I've got a couple of related here questions. I'm going to pitch it to you, Stephanie. Uh, can the framework scale for both large and small organizations? That's one question. And for the smaller organizations, how can they implement it, best implement it, given that they are so cost sensitive? Yeah, so... First off, yes, it is definitely adaptable to any size organization. Um, your priorities may change and some of those steps as we go along it, um, the roadmap and that five-step framework will look a little different for a smaller organization. Um, you know, the execution, the roadmap is going to be tailored to your organization. So the framework is definitely flexible to fit any size organization. Now, on that note, though, a smaller organization may have to be a bit more creative with how they interact with their suppliers and how they engage. You know, they may not be able to say we've actually seen an organization say, like, if you don't make your materials out of bio based materials, we're going to pull spin from you. And when it's a significant portion of, you know, a company's um, you know, revenue that makes a bigger difference. For a smaller organization that can't say that, they may have to be more collaborative. We use a little bit more of the, the carrot than the stick um, and work with their suppliers to understand like what can we do together to reduce emissions. Um, so I think that that's one of the things that comes in for a, a supplier, a smaller organization is sometimes more creativity and collaboration when dealing with their suppliers. And further related to that, here's another question I'll give to Stephanie, again, mm -hmm. on this on this issue of smaller companies. Have you seen cases where associations of small businesses commit to purchasing in a certain way to gain leverage to drive larger suppliers they share in common to reduce emissions? Is that a good way to go? And is it, are we seeing it? So uh, I don't know. I don't know that I've necessarily seen that. I have seen... Um, some of the groups coming together with like, how can we design things differently? And, and almost every industry has these consortiums. Um, and we've worked with ones in the chemical industry and in the semiconductor industry, et cetera, um, as they work together to say, how can we reduce our emissions for this particular thing? Or how can we use this product? I will also say that I've seen where um, companies that were wanting to get, and I've seen it a bit on the diversity side also, but within sustainability, I could see it happening too, where a group of companies will come together to bid out for an RFP. And they'll say, you know, we can bring our combined power together and our combined purchasing power. So I could see it being that way too. Okay. Thank you for that. Well, unfortunately, I hate to say that uh, this has been a great presentation, but we are just about out of time. It's time for just one final question, and I'm going to pitch it to both of you. I take the privilege of being the moderator, being the one that gets to ask it. So here it is. Uh, we all, with all the talk we've been, you know, we've been discussing here about best practices and way to go and what to do next. What is the one key takeaway in that respect that you want to leave our audience with today? Stephanie, why don't you start on that one? Sure. So I would say one of the main takeaways would be um, I would encourage the audience to think about their own organization's commitments. Um, as, you know, whether your organization has made them or not, kind of think through, you know, are you clear on how you're mobilizing to achieve those commitments? I know, Bob, you mentioned, you know, we've got a lot of commitments out there, but we're not always living up to those goals. So I would say um, really think about how you're going to mobilize to achieve those commitments especially in regards to your scope three emissions, your purchase goods and services. Um, I think there's a lot of emission reduction goals. Um, and now's the time to actually take real steps towards that journey. Spencer, what's your yeah. takeaway for us today? Yeah, so I'll build on Stephanie. Um, so absolutely, everybody should start thinking about what can I do? How do I start that conversation within my respective organizations? I think that the important piece to remember is when we look back at this time period, you know, sustainability, gen AI, there's a couple of macro transformational forces that are going to shape how businesses operate. And so it's easy to get stuck 
in kind of the muck of measurement and the individual nuts and bolts. But I think just messaging and making sure that we all view it and we all communicate uh, sustainability as this long run transformational force that can spur innovation in our value chains is incredibly important. Okay, thank you for that. And once again, a fantastic presentation and a couple of beautiful skylines thrown in for good measure. So thank you for that too, guys, in Chicago and New York City. Um, any audience questions that did not get answered for time considerations today, I'm sure that our speakers would only be too happy to address them offline. So um, be uh, thinking about that. I do want to offer the audience an additional resource here, a QR code that will help you to understand more about tackling your scope three emissions. There is a QR code that you can scan. There is a URL as well, which you do not have to bother to try to copy down in the few seconds it's going to be on screen because that will be provided to all attendees of this presentation. So there is that information. And finally, look for episode two in this Deloitte Supply Chain webinar series 2023 and 24 on AI, robotics, and technology in supply chain. That's November 9th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Once again, thank you, Spencer. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, audience, and everyone for a great presentation. Everybody, have a great day.